Welcome! As I mentioned in the previous episode, I will now talk about Second Army's retreat and its losses between January and March 1943. After smashing two Romanian, one Italian and one German army, the ostrogosk rossosh offensive was again successful, although the complete destruction of Hungarian, Italian and German units did not take place. Most units could break out of encirclement and retreated, suffering enormous casualties in the process. One week after the first clashes, the Free Hungarian Army Corps were in disarray. Third Corps was cut off from the rest of the army, its two light divisions covered the retreat of German Second Army. In the center, Fourth Corps was smashed into bits, two light divisions were destroyed, two others were encircled at Ostrogosk, they would break out later on and retreat towards Novi Oskol. Down south, 7th Corps also lost one light division, two others were encircled, their remnants broke out and moved towards Alexeyevka, then the Oskol Valley. This route had to be cleared by 1st Field Armored Division and two German infantry divisions to open the way for the retreating troops. In the last week of January, the remaining units of 4th and 7th Corps tried to get away from the advancing Soviet troops, but they were repeatedly encircled and attacked by fast-moving tanks and ski troops, while also being strafed by airplanes. Many horrible, weird and also comical events took place, which were explained later on by surviving participants. I will list some of these, relying on the interviews that took place around 1980, then I will talk about overall losses and the army's return. Perhaps the greatest enemy was the extreme cold. Temperatures often reached minus 35 degrees Celsius, but they even plunged to minus 45 degrees on some days. Many did not have protective equipment. They had to use ad hoc solutions. Frostbite was very common. Relieving themselves was a difficult task. They could not even unbutton their pants as their fingers were too numb, so they had to find a comrade who could still move his own fingers. Number two was an extremely complicated procedure. Some of them could not even get up after they were done, so they froze to death. One survivor described another comrade who was barely walking on the snow, taking tiny steps. Obviously, something was wrong. They took him to a first aid station, where his boots were cut off, and even the doctors were appalled by what they saw and smelled. The poor fellow didn't have skin or flesh on his feet. They had frozen and then they started to melt, becoming a soup inside the boots, so he was walking on the bones. Obviously, both feet had to be amputated, but he was somewhat lucky because the doctors still had anesthetic and he survived. Another retreating soldier saw Italians coming from the south and joining their column. Some of them were being pulled by a camel that was taking slow but long steps in the snow, while another Alpini had a dead cat hanging from his belt. It would become his next meal. Eating horse meat was very common. Dead animals littered the road. Sometimes the starving soldiers didn't even cook the meat properly. They started chewing the barely warm flesh. Some unfortunate souls found shelter in a former sugar factory, in which a weird green liquid, most likely sugar mixed with oil and grease, filled a great hole in the floor. The soldiers drank the suspicious but sweet juice, which resulted in mass diarrhea about 15 minutes later, further weakening and humiliating them. Clashes between German and Hungarian troops were also frequent, although in most cases the Germans disarmed their allies or forced them to stay outside during the night. Complaints were so numerous that a document was forwarded to Hitler himself, after which he issued an order explaining that even though Hungarian soldiers were not as brilliant and perfect as their German counterparts, this did not mean that violence should be used against Allied troops. Naturally, his order did not improve the situation. Retreating German troops often used their allies to cover their own retreat and were hostile to them. In one small village, Hungarian soldiers were thrown out of the only intact building by their German allies. 
After this, the Hungarians gathered around the building, lit it on fire, threw their hand grenades in, and dealt with those who tried to escape. Not even the wounded were treated honorably. One medical column was stopped by a German unit that put its own wounded on the sleighs and left the Hungarians there, who had to abandon their wounded in the freezing cold. A nearby hospital was first emptied of the German wounded, then it was put on fire, but the Hungarian wounded were left behind. They were then picked up by two Hungarian vehicles who transported them to safety, and although some of them died during the journey, the participants were later given medals for their actions. Two other Hungarian soldiers were in a bottomed truck with their captain. They were stopped by two German officers, who were not holding their pistols, but kept the holsters open, signaling that they were ready to use force if necessary. The Germans ordered them off the truck, they wanted to take it for themselves, but instead of giving up the vehicle, the driver picked up his submachine gun and sprayed the two Germans, then drove over their dead bodies, continuing the journey. At another location, a retreating Hungarian column was stopped by their own military police, but the column's commander simply shot the MP who was trying to disarm him, then his troops continued their retreat. Obviously, such subjective stories do not give us the full picture. Each soldier had different experiences during the retreat. Some were shot on sight, others were taken prisoner, although they could still escape captivity by marching in the opposite direction, as they were often not guarded. A few friendly soldiers were saved by the citizens or their partisan allies who recognized them, but thousands ended up in Soviet prisoner of war camps, where cholera and typhus continued to decimate them. Even if they survived, years of hard labor was waiting for them, which was often equal to a death sentence. As I mentioned in the previous video, around 17,000 men gathered in the Oskol Valley in early February, while smaller German and Hungarian groups were holding Alexeyevka, Budjeni, and Novi Oskol. More stragglers arrived in the coming weeks, partly from Third Corps, whose remnants had to march northwest, west, then south, to reach the Oskol River. By early March, 64,000 men were roughly 100 kilometers behind the front. Lieutenant General Yani first issued his famous order, in which he condemned his army for losing its honor, but later he revised this document and emphasized that despite the circumstances, his troops fought bravely and managed to avoid complete destruction. Still, roughly half of Second Army was lost, casualties reached 135,000, of which 35,000 were Jewish laborers. 15,000 wounded were sent back to Hungary, but almost all the artillery was gone, only six tanks remained, 85% of the heavy weapons and horses were lost. The Hungarian army never recovered from this defeat. At first, it was suggested that the survivors should be organized into three divisions and take over a shorter section of the front, where smaller German formations were trying to slow down the Soviet advance. In mid-March, the Defense Ministry ordered that 2nd Army HQ should reorganize and keep two light divisions in the area for security purposes. A German request arrived for five additional security divisions. They also offered the option of sending Hungarian occupation troops to the Balkans, but this was declined due to a fear of direct confrontation with the Western Allies. After a meeting between Hitler and Horthy, the decision was made to transport all remaining troops back to Hungary. This took place in May and June 1943, with the exception of those soldiers who were assigned security duties in Ukraine. Eleven security divisions remained in the region, while in Hungary a massive reorganization started to take shape in order to begin modernization. I will talk about these efforts in the next few episodes, but I will also take a look at the occupation forces, because they deserve a closer look. Thank you for watching, see you in the next video.